Chapter 14 is one of my favorite chapters in the two semester curriculum. Uh, a lot of what I did my doctorate work on. NMR spectroscopy. Okay? NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. And it's yet another tool in our analytical toolbox building off of a lot of the stuff we saw in chapter 13. All right, we've got mass spec, we've got IR, a little bit of UV vis. And in this chapter, we'll spend all of the chapter talking about different forms of NMR. Okay. And this is a technique that was developed in the 40s, okay, the 1940s. It's a really common organic technique. Okay. Many chemists are familiar with it. And it's common because sometimes you can use it to determine an entire structure, okay, unlike something like mass spec or IR because we can get information about individual atoms and the atoms that neighbor those atoms as well. Yep. So we're gonna talk about NMR spectroscopy that identifies carbon-carbon framework, okay, how all the carbons are bonded together. That actually comes at the, toward the end of the chapter and carbon-hydrogen framework. Yep. So all the CH bonds we have, where they are, what's going on there. Uh, but that's not the only thing that NMR can do. Okay? There are a lot of things that are NMR active. Okay? Any nuclei that have an odd number of protons, an odd number of neutrons, or both an odd number of protons and neutrons can be NMR active and therefore studied by NMR. So basically the only thing that can't be is if you have an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons. Okay? Those are NMR inactive. The most common form of NMR is called proton NMR. Okay, so if you just hear NMR and nothing else, you would assume that it's proton NMR. But you know, there's nitrogen NMR or fluorine NMR, phosphorus NMR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So how does it work? What's going on? Yep. Well, because a nucleus has a charge, right? Because protons, right? and it's spinning around, it has a magnetic moment and therefore generates its own magnetic field. In the absence of any applied external magnetic field, the magnetic moments of those nuclei are kind of just shooting all over the place, right? They're randomly oriented. But if we use a magnet to apply a magnetic field, we can get these into a more organized state. Okay. And they can be one of two things. If we're applying the magnetic field this way, pointing up to this red arrow, it's one of two ways. They can either be aligned directly with the magnetic field, that's called the alpha spin state, or against the magnetic field, that's called the beta spin state. Okay. And of course, this beta spin state, as you can see here, it's higher in energy because there's more energy that's needed to align directly opposite the applied magnetic field. But those are the only two possibilities, right? It's not going to be sideways. It's either with alpha or perfectly against beta. And the difference in the energy there depends on the strength of the applied magnetic field. Right? The greater the strength, the larger the energy difference here. So how is this useful to us? The fact that we can affect the spin state with an applied magnetic field. Yeah, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because I forgot about this slide. Let's jump right ahead to the next one, right? This gets to what I finished the last slide with, right? The stronger the applied magnetic field, the greater the energy difference between the two spin states, okay? So as we see here, going from right to left, we're getting a stronger applied magnetic field, and that's increasing the energy difference there. And there are several different types of NMR, a 300 megahertz NMR is typically the base model. Okay, though they do have weaker ones like 60 or 150 that can even be benchtop models. But they go from 300 to 600, they can be 1,000, 1,500. Those more powerful magnets give better readings, but they're more expensive, they're more sensitive, right? take more upkeep. So basically what's happening? How are we reading these things? Okay. Well, we hit them with radiation that corresponds to the exact energy difference there. And then we flip the spin
from those nuclei from the alpha state and promoting them to the beta state. That's called radio frequency radiation or RF radiation. Okay, so radio frequency radiation. We have nuclei that are at the bottom, we hit them with radiation and we bump them to the top. They go from alpha down up to beta. And when those spins flip, right, they generate signals. The frequency of that signal depends on the energy difference between the alpha and the beta states. And it's called nuclear magnetic resonance because the nuclei are said to be in resonance with the radiation, flipping back and forth from the alpha to the beta state. And that signal is used to garner information. An NMR spectrum, as we'll see in just a minute, is a plot of frequency versus intensity. So a little bit more about that energy difference, right? The strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the operating frequency. Okay? So the strength of the magnetic field, proportional to the operating frequency. Okay? The difference in energy okay, corresponds to Planck's constant, okay? the general magnetic ratio, the constant that depends on the nuclei we're dealing with, the strength of the magnetic field in Tesla, and two pi. This is not an equation that I'll expect you to work with, right? Just know that the strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the operating frequency in megahertz. Higher frequency is better resolution. Okay? They're more powerful. I give better readings, but they're more expensive. Yeah. These things have to have multiple radiation sources to tune to specific nuclei. Yeah. Depending on what you're working with, is it hydrogen, is it carbon? Uh, those different nuclei have different frequencies. Yeah. So they have multiple radiation sources to promote from the alpha to the beta state. Before we actually look at a spectrum and the information it gives us, right? how do we actually get the data? How are these things run? Yeah, well, this is what a sample looks like. Okay. It's called an NMR tube in this individual's hand. You dissolve a really small amount in the tube, right? just a couple of milligrams, in about a half a milliliter of solvent. Okay. We'll talk more about solvents later. But then that tube is put right, into another vesicle to put in the NMR. It spins around right, in this tool in a powerful magnetic field. And the reason it spins and it spins really quickly is to average the position of the molecules within the magnetic field. Okay. So you've got your NMR tube, goes in this holder, gets loaded in the top of the machine. It gets a reading. And just like we had FTIR, Fourier Transform IR, we have FTNMR for our NMR spectrometers. Yep. The magnetic field is held constant and we get a radio frequency pulse of a really short dur duration to promote all of the protons at the same time. Yep. So it's radiation over a range of frequencies. It promotes all of our protons simultaneously, flips all of the spins from alpha to beta. And that signal that comes from that, uh, it, it appears at a frequency that corresponds to the energy difference while they're falling back down. Okay? And that's called free induction decay, FID, free induction decay. That's what's giving us our signal. And then the computer uses the Fourier transform process to give us a spectrum, which again is gonna be a plot of intensity versus frequency. And it's, it's quick, especially proton NMR. It can happen in just a matter of seconds, at one or two seconds. So usually we run several plots and average them together to get a reading. Uh, but of course, if we're trying to get information about a molecule, uh, then something has to be different, right? Why are these things showing up in different spots? Because if every proton was the same, this would be useless. And they're different and we get different readings for different hydrogens or whatever we're looking at with NMR. Okay? Every atom in a molecule has a different environment okay? because the hydrogens or whatever atom we're looking at don't experience the same magnetic field. If they did, this, like I said, this technique would be useless. Okay? 
what we're interested in is called right, the effective magnetic field, okay, which is equal to the applied magnetic field minus the local magnetic field. So the effect of the neighboring nuclei there gets subtracted out of what we're applying from the instrument. And the effective magnetic field is what we're getting read of. And this local business here exists because these nuclei, right, they're in a cloud of electrons. And that, to a degree, shields it from the applied magnetic field. But for different atoms, that value is different. Yep. Electrons circle the nuclei and induce a local magnetic field that op opposes the applied magnetic field. Right, hence why it's subtracted, but depending on what our environment is, that effect will differ. Okay. So the local magnetic field from the electrons here subtracts from the applied magnetic field. Every environment is different. Okay, this is constant from the instrument, but every environment is different. So that gives us different effective magnetic fields. And that's why we get unique signals for different things that are NMR active. Unless they're identical. If they're in an identical environment, then they will give us the same signal as we'll see. It's not like every single hydrogen is guaranteed to give us a signal. More on that later. So that brings us to an idea of diamagnetic shielding. If we're subtracting out, right, that B local, that local magnetic field, the greater the electron density, wherever the proton, if we're doing proton NMR, and let's just assume for the slides moving forward, we are doing proton NMR, uh, the greater the electron density, wherever that proton exists, the greater the local magnetic field. Therefore, when that value is greater, it gets subtracted out from the applied magnetic field. It gives us a smaller value of the effective magnetic field. Thus, we appear these readings at a lower frequency. Yeah. So this is summarizing all of that nicely for us. A larger effective magnetic field means we're de-shielded, means it's a higher frequency for us to come into resonance, right? a greater energy difference there. So we appear further left, which we call downfield. That's a good thing to remember right now. Downfield means we're further to the left for our NMR spectrum. So that's the, you know, draw a line in here. That's the opposite on the top. Okay, this is a lower frequency, right? Great electron density. Here, de-shielded means less electron density, higher frequency, further left downfield, whereas these would be upfield. So another way to put that, protons in electron-rich environments sense a smaller magnetic field and thus have a lower frequency to come into resonance, and they appear further to the right, which is upfield. Okay. Two different opposing ideas, whatever way you like to remember it. Left-hand side is high frequency, just like an IR, okay. that's downfield. Right-hand side is low frequency, upfield. Okay. So again, see it right here, left-hand side, downfield. Right-hand side, upfield. On the left, these have a larger effective magnetic field, higher frequency, everything opposite down here. Shielded on the right, de-shielded on the left. So we'll finish this section by identifying how many signals we would expect to see, because I said not everything is guaranteed to give us a signal. And it comes down to whether or not they are chemically equivalent and existing in the exact same environment. Now, every set of chemically equivalent protons produces a unique signal for proton NMR. So here we see three signals, okay? Not seven, there's seven total hydrogens, but they give us three signals because these two hydrogens are chemically equivalent, these two are chemically equivalent, and these three are chemically equivalent, right? And if that's hard to understand, draw the molecule out or better yet, build it with a model kit and consider it in three dimensions. Okay. You know, they're bonded to the same carbon. They have the same proximity to everything else in the molecule. Those single bonds can freely rotate. So they're chemically equivalent. Three signals here. Okay. 
here's a bunch of other ones to consider. Really good for practice, right? We just did ethyl bromide up here, but take a minute, pause this video or look at your notes, go through and actually look at this and consider how many signals you would actually get. The answers are there, but make sure you can identify where they're chemically equivalent and why. This is really nice because they're, if they're equivalent, they're labeled with the same letter, right? A, B, and C. It can get a little bit tricky when those bonds are locked into place. So make sure you're thinking about them in three dimensions. Okay. Now, if your bonds are locked into place, which is gonna happen if you have a pi bond, double bond or triple bond or a ring, right? these are the ones that can be troublesome. Okay? Because you might think that these two on the left are chemically equivalent. Okay, clearly this one's different being bonded to the carbon with bromine. But why are these two not equivalent? Why do we get three signals here? Okay, for uh, bromoethene, and actually I, I think I spoke with, misspoke. I think I called that ethyl bromide when it should be propyl bromide. Okay. But why are these two different? Well, this is locked into place. This can no longer freely rotate. If it could, then these hydrogens would be the same. But because it can't, this one is locked into place closer in 3D to bromine than this one. Okay, so three different bromine or three different hydrogens. Same thing over here, right? The hydrogens that are locked into place on the top because that ring is not going to interconvert, right? They're locked into place. The hydrogens on the top are different from the hydrogens on the bottom. Yeah, so take a minute, think these over, identify why they are or are not equivalent between slides 12 and 13. That'll be a really good thing to practice, and that's where we're going to end this video. But make sure you take the time to identify that because it will be critical moving forward in our understanding.